Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Digital Leadership Series event um, featuring Sean Taylor from Lyft. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome all of you. My name is Vijay Gurbaksani. I'm the director of the Center for Digital Transformation. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the center in just a minute or so. Uh, we were founded in 2012, and our goal at the Business School at UCI Mirage was to help incumbent companies in particular adapt to a, dig a more digital world. Uh, and, and the leadership, you know, in fact, our, the tagline for our business school is developing leaders for a digitally driven world. And over the last nine years that we've been around, sort of the scope of responsibilities for all managers all the way from entry level to the top around digital transformation have become more and more complex, more and more profound. So from challenges like cybersecurity to building new business models for a digital world, um, these challenges are, are uh, front and center for managers throughout companies. Uh, before I get started, I would just like to make a couple of housekeeping announcements and I'll introduce Sean and the subject for today. Um, um, number one, we're gonna be using the Q&A feature, not the chat function, so please list your questions. You type them into the Q&A option uh, on your screens and I will moderate the, the first 20 minutes or so are going to be Sean presenting a talk. I'm going to talk to him for the next 15 or so minutes, and we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, and we'll be taking questions, like I said, from the audience. Uh, and, and the last thing, when probably the most important, not the most important, one of the most important things is um, I would like to thank KPMG and Kalpana Ramakrishnan in particular um, for supporting this series. Uh, we bring these series to the community as, as a university. Our goal is to educate not just the students uh, who, who go here, but also sort of our surrounding community. So with that, uh, thank you KPMG for making this event possible and for allowing us to offer it on a complimentary basis to all of our attendees. Uh, with that, let me turn, or, turn to sort of the subject for this evening. Uh, one of the most sort of challenging aspects around leadership in a digitally driven world has to do with managing data driven organizations. Uh, you know, we've all heard the overused metaphor of, uh, or analogy of data is the new oil, which I think is a little bit tired and a little bit overused and doesn't begin to reveal the complexities uh, of what it really means to be a data driven organization. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a raw asset and, 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 and running a data-driven organization is, is quite different from the way we used to do it in the past. Uh, with that, we're extremely fortunate to have Sean Taylor of Lyft speaking to us. Uh, I've known Sean since he was a doctoral student at NYU at the Stern School of Business. And uh, you know, he was one of the first uh, uh, doctorates for, to actually go into practice and built an expertise in data science. Uh, he spent seven years at Facebook leading a statistical team, and now he's at Lyft uh, leading a, a team called Rideshare Labs. What's interesting about, you know, as you might imagine, all of us have taken services like Lyft, and as you might imagine, there's this operational optimization that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis in our companies, but it, there's also long-term and riskier initiatives that we need to invest in. And Rideshare Labs is the data science team that, which, which Sean heads, which focuses on um, sort of riskier, longer term initiatives. So, so with that, uh, let me thank Sean for spending his time with us. I know he has an incredibly business, a business, a busy schedule. So very appreciative that he's taken the time uh, to spend educating all of us today. So with that, Sean, thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Thanks Vijay for the great introduction. Uh, really happy to be here. Uh, excited to talk about data science. I'm, I'm particularly excited for the questions. I think usually the prepared content always pales in comparison to the great questions that people always have. So looking forward to that. Um, <clears throat> I have a little bit of prepared material um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk through some slides. And my main goal here is to sort of motivate some of the work that we do at Lyft in the data science space from the perspective of what are our business problems? What are we really trying to solve? Uh, and I hope that will sort of help illustrate how we're, how we're actually solving problems, why the data is useful, and how it makes the business better to have a team of data scientists. I mean, we, we have over 200 data scientists at Lyft, and they all work really hard. What are they all doing? I, th I think I'm going to help, help you answer those questions a little bit better. And then maybe we can talk a little bit about, like, what, are the, what, are, what do we need to do as an organization to facilitate uh, their work? So I'll first start with the hardest part of any presentation, which is sharing my screen. So. Lyft's ride-sharing business is a two-sided marketplace. 
We've got demand that's growing. It's a, well, it was growing until COVID and it's growing again uh, now that now that we're recovering from COVID, uh, mostly driven by organic adoption of our product as a substitute for taking cars uh, and also by transit sometimes. Um, and then we have a growth of supply, which is the other side of the marketplace, which are uh, our drivers who either are full-time drivers or want a place to earn flexibly um, using an asset that they already own, their car. And um, what we're trying to compete on generally is just sort of like provide a value proposition in terms of convenience, time savings and price for the in-car experience. Um, and then for drivers, you know, the earnings and the flexibility that they're able to achieve on our platform. Um, so that's that's the goal of, of Lyft and our ride sharing business in particular. The core problems that we run into in running this are, are basically growth. Um, increasing adoption over time is important. We need a, a large marketplace is better because it has more density, which means we're more likely to be able to match riders to drivers uh, quickly. It's also better for the business because we do more volume. Um, and so we have to do that by adding new features, promoting the product or using incentives of various kinds. Uh, we'd like to produce good experiences for everybody who uses our product. So uh, any anytime you, a driver cancels on you or something like that, we'd have to make sure that that happens a minimal amount of times and that we respond to it with you know good customer service. We want to run the marketplace very efficiently, uh, which means making sure that we make a small number of mistakes in terms of how we match riders to drivers, uh, how we route people to their destinations, uh, how we do navigation. And anything that could contribute to sort of a negative experience needs to be uh, uh, mitigated as much as possible. And then finally, market balance, which I'm going to talk about in a little more, little bit more detail, uh, which is ensuring that we have the right amount of drivers for the marketplace. Um, too many, and the drivers sit around and don't have anything to do, and they don't make enough money. Um, and too few means that people wait a long time, and it's it's very difficult for them to get a ride. Um, and so we have to sort of form form the right balance of how many drivers that they want to have in the marketplace. So starting with that market balance idea, here, here's a diagram that I think illustrates like a, a, a very simplistic causal model of, of Lyft's business. So we have sort of like uh, our drivers showing up and the sessions are what we call it when a, when a rider requests a ride. And drivers plus sessions equal rides. They, they kind of contribute toward creating a, a, a place where, or this, when the rider gets matched to a driver, that, that's, a, that's a ride. Um, incentives are how we increase the number of drivers on our platform in the short run. So, so we can provide drivers with bonuses uh, or other kinds of in, uh, incentives to show up and drive for the day. And this is our main tool for improving the number of drivers on the platform and addressing the market balance issues that I described. And then riders and driver, drivers and rides combine to create like a rides per driver metric, which is basically like, you know, how many how much they're going to earn. So a notion of like whether they have enough uh, rides for each driver we have in the marketplace. And then also a sense of like, there's a sense in which having more drivers uh, helps produce future sessions for the for the platform and retention by helping ensure that we have good experiences for all the, all the people requesting rides. So a super simple model, but it covers one decision variable, which is our incentives, um, something that we don't control, which is sessions, and then the outcomes that we care about, which are short-term rides and rides per driver, and then this like future sessions idea, which is our long-term value that we're creating. So we call this incentives effect on drivers uh, a lever. Levers are a generic concept we'll talk about in a second, but it's, it's something that we can control, which is why we call it a lever. And then uh, how drivers and sessions turn into rides, we call a production function, it's sort of like, just like in standard economics, you have these inputs and you put the inputs into the production function and you get your outputs. In this case, it happens to be rides. So levers uh, have this sort of diminishing marginal return shape to them commonly. Um, so we, we spend money, that's what happens on the X axis here. And then on the Y axis, we get some, uh, some incremental benefit in some, usually non-dollar terms. Uh, so we put money in and we get something out. In this case, it's more drivers on the platform that day. Um, it's a very generic concept. We spend money on lots of things to generate these incremental benefits that have some, some sort of like theorized relationship to the success of the business. So driver incentives, coupons for riders, uh, even things like staffing airport pickup locations that we, we might pay people to go and help people find the, you know, find out where the lift rides are at the airport. And that's the thing we can spend money on. And that actually does produce a benefit. And we'd, we would like to know sort of like whether the incrementality of that benefit is worth the cost. Even something like a car maintenance program uh, for drivers. So we could give them like discounts to get their car serviced and that might help them stay on the road or drive more safely. The production function is 
what creates the actual value. Um, so we put drivers in and then for varying levels of sessions, we'll get different numbers of rides. And this also has a diminishing marginal return kind of shape. Um, and so knowing this shape properly helps us basically convert incremental drivers into incremental rides, which might, which may be our goal. And so the production function uh, tells us how we, how efficiently we're able to uh, make output out of our inputs. It also tells us, um, it's also something we're constantly trying to improve by improving the efficiency of the business. So it, by shifting the production function in various it upward means that we're actually getting better at matching drivers to riders. So everything I just told you, I think sort of is enough to derive almost all the ways in which data science can improve Lyft's business. Um, and it's it's actually ma mainly three main, three main ways. Um, in the first category, we have forecasting. Um, so knowing how many sessions we're going to have in advance helps us figure out how many drivers we're going to need. And so we spend a large amount of time making sure to, that our forecasts are accurate so that we're able to kind of uh, figure out what the optimal level of drivers should be. Number two is improving lever efficiency. So by using machine learning models and algorithmic targeting of incentives, uh, we can actually shift this curve upward and for the, for the same amount of spend on incentives, uh, achieve a higher number of incremental drivers. And so that's that's a whole other whole other pillar pillar of work is basically like taking all the levers that lift and making them work more efficiently through machine learning usually. Um, and then third is directly improving the production function. So for the same number of drivers and the same number of sessions, can we make more rides? And that means making sure that we match more efficiently, that the drivers are positioned more effectively, that we make better decisions about dispatch and pricing. Um, and so this is like mostly the algorithmic changes that that uh, that power the marketplace. So our, our forecasting capability, it mainly relies on seasonality and growth models that capture sort of like how demand and supply vary according to weather and holidays, even things like school and work schedule, um, our market saturation, uh, competition and price levels. Um, and then there are also things that we have to put in the model that are not reflected in historical data, things like ma manual overrides. Like we, we might know that uh, a very famous example is Amazon has a holiday party coming up um, in, the, in the Seattle area. We have to know about that and make sure that we have enough drivers on the road. Um, and when we build out a forecasting capability, we also have to make sure that the forecasts stay accurate over time. So it's, it's an important kind of component of forecasting to ensure that not only was your forecast good today, but every forecast that you make moving forward over the next year are, are similarly accurate. And they, they do tend to depreciate in quality over time without kind of active tending to like where they tend to make mistakes. On the lever efficiency side, uh, we spend a lot of time developing experimentation strategies for randomly deploying different treatments. So uh, in the case of driver incentives, we might give some drivers incentives randomly in order to understand the causal effect of those incentives on their propensity to drive. Um, and then we would use machine learning in order to discover the heterogeneity and the effects of those incentives. Um, and in this case, better machine learning models through say improved features or complexity of the models would directly drive better efficiency for a lever. These tend to be non-real-time systems. So things like we can deploy coupons every week or incentives every morning, and it can be done in batch. So it's a, a sort of like lower, lower level of reliability needed than some of the other algorithms that drive the marketplace. And then on the production function or al algorithmic side, uh, these are decisions that we're making in real time, um, 24 seven um, as we run the marketplace in all, all 74 regions that we operate. Um, and so there's, there's two main ones that I want to talk about. First is pricing. So we have to decide on a customized price for every session millions of times per day based on the, um, the conditions of the market, where the ride's going, where it's, where it's originated from, the time of day, um, all go into the pricing algorithm. So there's sort of like a complex balance there, finding the right price, making sure that we meet all of our costs, that the driver's paid properly, um, and that we can become profitable. We have our dispatch algorithm, which is responsible for matching uh, available drivers to the ride requests uh, that are made. And so between those two algorithms, we, we are driving the marketplace. We're sort of like making all the decisions that coordinate where the drivers are driving to, who they're picking up and where they're jumping off. Um, these are complicated uh, machine learning powered systems with a lot of heuristics baked into them, but also you know machine learning models to help uh, estimate some of the important quantities that go into the decisions. They have heavy, upfront development costs, very high reliability requirements, um, and they need to be monitored constantly because any mistakes that they make uh, are, are gonna directly translate into loss for the company. 
And then finally, uh, as we start to develop better algorithms, we actually need to decide when is a new algorithm better than the old algorithm that we were running. So if we make a change to our pricing system or a change to our dispatch system, uh, it's important for us to be able to validate that that was a, that was a good change. And, and to do that, we run marketplace experiments. Uh, so almost every change we make is going to be it's going to be tested in a live environment in some way in order to verify that it that it's that it's making an improvement. Um, and these marketplace effects are challenging to estimate and require basically running the entire market in some places in, in a different configuration um, for some set amount of time. So we developed a, a technology we call time split experiments to solve this challenge. And uh, just to briefly show you what that looks like, uh, it's, a, it's similar to an A-B test uh, where we would say assign users to different conditions, but instead of users, it's time slots. So here's an example of uh, the way that we run it, which is we have two weeks of, typically these tests run for two weeks and we divide days up into different blocks. And then we have this mirroring and reflection approach where for every time slot that we run at the treatment condition in, the following week we would invert it and run the opposite. Um, so we get this nice randomization, but we get sort of a nice control case by using the week before or the week after uh, as a control variable. So sort of a fun statistical challenge that we, that we face as we start to try to build um, an efficient estimator for whether um, our marketplace changes are, develop, are, are delivering value by running the marketplace in that configuration. All right. So all the all the things that I talked about all of, all involve building a lot of infrastructure and investment in order to support them. And it's it's it's, it's incredibly challenging to to do all of these data science tasks uh, with a high degree of reliability and continue to innovate and drive value for the company. Um, and so, so for, on the people side, it starts with leadership and building good teams through good recruiting and good hiring practices, onboarding and training, and then sustaining a high quality data science community within the company to so make sure that people are learning from each other and building the skills that they need from watching each other work. Um, and the data science team doesn't work in isolation. We actually partner quite closely with engineering teams, designers, uh, product managers, uh, people in operations. Those, those collaborations can be better or worse and can yield better quality results. Um, on the system side, uh, there's a lot, there's a data scientists operate up and down the entire technical stack, all the way from like instrumenting, uh, logging, working on making sure data infrastructure is running reliably building and augmenting our A-B testing platform, um, building models and the whole model life cycle, productionizing models, make sure they're, they're running, running uh, um, that they're running properly and not making mistakes. And that this evaluation and quality monitoring is just sort of, sort of like a constant investment that we make. So I'll, I'll stop there. It was a lot of text and a lot of me talking and love to get to the discussion, but uh, I hope that sort of gives, you, gives a little insight into how we think about using data science to build value uh, for the business and for our customers at Lyft. Great. Um, keep, hey, Sean, keep your slides up actually. Sure, no problem. And Aaron, if you could turn my video on or do I turn it on? So, you, you, you know, let's just start with sort of, that was a great presentation, so thank you. Um, and, you know, what I'd like to do is sort of just discuss some of these co concepts that you brought up. So the first thing I want to compliment you on is, you know, we do this a lot and you've really sort of reduced the Lyft business down to its core with this, you know, how many circles is one to three, four, six circles and some circles and errors that we usually make fun of in academia, but you know, it really works to show sort of what the key processes are. You know, every company has a lot of supporting processes. And then of course the core processes, which I think this is a, and I love, you know, you're talking about sort of, the, and then the levers, but if you were to talk about sort of the customer value proposition and the writer value proposition as two separate entities, what are the sort of the core drivers of each of those? Like what do customers value and what do drivers value? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out that they're kind of at odds in some ways. Um, so drivers are the easiest because I think like they basically care about being utilized, having a passenger in the car, um, for as much of the time that they're driving as possible is what is what every driver is going for because it's, help, it's what helps them earn the most money. Um, so, so for a driver, um, dropping someone off and then immediately picking somebody up is sort of like what we want. And that, that sort of happens when there just aren't that many drivers. So that when there's very few drivers, they become very highly utilized. Um, having very few drivers is bad for riders because it means that there's unlikely that there's a driver close to them when they request a ride. So we have to find some balance between those objectives. So, so for a rider, the, the goal is that there's so many drivers 
around that when they request a ride, there's somebody like almost immediately there. Um, and that's that would lead to very low utilization. And so we sort of have this this delicate dance to, to make here where we want the, the market to be balanced uh, so that drivers earn a fair wage and a, above an earnings threshold that, that we'd like to hit, but that we also make sure that the rider experience um, is, is good, that they don't wait for longer than some threshold. So it's, it's challenging. And, and in some places and times, it can be difficult to, to hit both of those at the same time. Yeah, so that, of course, depends on the liquidity of any given marketplace, right? So if it's concentrated, you have a higher chance of achieving achieving a more liquid outcome. And if it's uh, less dense, then it's harder to sort of match riders and drivers. Um, and and so, and, and then you said you focus on, so, so you know, there's, there's the companies running on a day-to-day -day basis, you, as you said. Um, so when, when a customer presses uh, to, you know, his, his, his or her screen and ask for a car, like what are the backend processes that, ha I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes on and there's some local, there's some immediate optimization, which I suspect your team may have worked on in the past, but is now in the operational system. What, can you give us a sense of the complexity of what is actually going on to generate a car and a price? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the, the first thing that has to happen is we have to, um, uh, we have to price and so you, you'll put in sort of a, a origin and a destination we, we call them odts origin destination and time um, are, are roughly the set of things that would yield and, and, and we don't just come up with one price we have a price for standard rides a price for um, you know we have up some high value modes uh, where you, you can kind of like pay more for a nicer car um, and then we have we have like wait and save which is like you can uh, pay a little bit less to if you're willing to wait longer. So we, we actually have to create like a bundle of prices. So there's a pricing algorithm that will run and you'll choose the mode by which you want to, you know, request the ride. And then that mode will, will turn into a, a request in our dispatch system. So with, within dispatch, we're basically, we have a pool of available drivers and we have a pool of ride requests that are made and we're running this uh, matching cycle Matching cycle happens like every three seconds or so. We do a, a global optimization over all available drivers and all ride requests and try to come up with the best possible matching. Um, we actually rematch now. So, so you might've seen sometimes like we, we found a better ride for you. That's sort of like sometimes we'll actually unmatch you and rematch you with somebody else. Um, in order to do that matching cycle, we have to ask, estimate how far the driver is away from you. So the ETA algorithm is what, what we use to do that. So for any two points on the map at this exact moment, we'd like to estimate how long it would take to get from one point to the other. And that's a key input in matching because without knowing that we would probably be uh, dispatching uh, drivers from too far away. So we would like to kind of like minimize the amount of time that they spend driving. Um, and, and even knowing say like what direction that a driver is headed down a highway can help with matching because it helps sort of like make the ETA estimate more, more precise. Because if we know that they have to actually get off the exit and then turn around and go back, that will take more time than getting off the exit and going to the, to the right side of the road. Um, so ETA algorithm is a very important component in building a more efficient marketplace. So, so really those are the core algorithms are sort of like pricing, uh, the dispatch matching cycle, and then the ETA algorithm that powers the dispatch. And then in terms of, levers like what are the you know what are the key levers that for example drivers respond to obviously you said it's about you know they want to understandably maximize their their income in the amount of time they want to work that day uh but part of the challenge i guess is getting more drivers to drive in a region in some cases and so what are some of the things you you mentioned couponing and other things that uh you said some run weekly some run daily uh, what, what what's going on there yeah i think the uh Driver behavior is, is pretty, we think of it as pretty economically motivated. Um, so there, there are ways to improve driver experience. And we, we do have um, driver centers in most, in most cities where they can come in and like, you know, get, get answers to questions and get their car serviced and things like that. And we do think that that's helpful. Um, but, you know, mainly, mainly it's just sort of like, uh, if you talk to drivers, it's just sort of like how much did they earn in the last week and what is their average earning and the earnings rate is very important. Um, we, we, we are trying to kind of like innovate on getting people through, uh, you know, the getting more drivers on the road means getting them through uh, an approval process, background checks and all that stuff very efficiently. So there's an operational burden to making sure that we can kind of create, uh, take a person who wants to drive for Lyft and get them onto the road to drive for Lyft as efficiently as possible while retaining the you know ability to do that safely, make sure that they like pass all of the quality checks and have the right car and their car is safe to drive. So lots of 
lots of stuff that like we can make more efficient to get drivers on the road. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, I think it, it just boils down to sort of like, uh, did we did we help them earn money today? And we can do it in other ways besides actually through matching, like we can help them know where to drive. So we, we do build products that sort of like help them say, this is the part of the city where you should you should head to right now because you're more likely to get a good a good ride at that point. Yeah, no, it's funny because like, you know, because you know, we do research in this area, I always ask questions of all my drivers and it's interesting to me how with you know, with the taxi cab companies and the other, you know, you couldn't get that kind of optimization. Whereas now, sort of, they know the neighborhoods in which, at least once upon a time, a lot of people would go to the airport in the morning, for example. So clearly, that's part of the matching algorithm uh, as well. A uh, quick question. So, um, uh, one of the things that I think is, you know, at the center, we believe that all companies need to think like software companies. And and one of the things you said when we were talking about this session. Uh, and I, I asked you something about like who builds the software and you said, you know, in addition to the data piece, you have a really not within uh, Rideshare Labs, but overall at Lyft, you have a very talented software team and sort of their expertise in open source and weaving together sort of very com this very complex platform is is done internally. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all built in house and we, we do leverage a lot of open source tools and it, it, it is uh, it is a it's a super high reliability uh, environment. So, we, you know, any, any downtime that we have for any of these algorithms means that we can't, everyone gets the worst possible experience, which is not being able to use the, the marketplace at all. Um, and so the, so we sort of have a, a microservices architecture, which is like designed for really having that kind of resilient, uh, you know, resilient system where when things go down, they we can spin up new versions of them very quickly and we don't exhibit a lot of downtime. Um, and then, you know, when we build in all these machine learning models into the stack, it, it, add, it adds a lot of um, potential for other, other types of failures that are not really software failures, but like model failures. And so we have to be resilient to that as well. So, so, so for us, I think a lot of this just boils down to like software quality uh, is, is part of the business proposition. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and having bad quality software would mean that you, you know, your customers wouldn't stick with you. They would rather go to the company that has better quality. Um, and that also that you know we as data scientists are introducing variation into this process and it needs to be also sort of like adds a higher degree of burden on the engineers. Yes, so you know that and I actually think there's a very fundamentally different. You know, with, uh, I used to do a lot of work on sort of make versus buy in software, and you know what we're seeing with this new generation of companies is that they're all make, they're all made. Uh, it's not like you don't use components that you know I've looked actually under the stack because the stuff is publicly available on. Lyft, for example, and, and there's a lot of common building blocks uh, that we all do, but the value add piece of it is the top like I have two quick questions for them. There's a lot of questions I'd rather go to. I'm going to, I have the opportunity to talk to you again. But, uh, um, one of this, uh, a couple of the questions that I want to touch on, which I, I think are referred to by the, the audience as well, which is actually, and you just referred to it. Uh, how do you sort of monitor the reliability of your machine learning models uh, as you sort of take them from R&D into production. Maybe I'll just throw in the second question as well. Uh, and then you have this whole shift, you know, courtesy of the pandemic. Uh, and then obviously a lot of the past data and the, the data that your learning models were built on are probably no longer relevant. Uh, so yeah. if you can answer those two questions, then I'll go over to some of the questions from the audience. I, um... COVID is a very unfortunate situation for everybody in the world, but we, we're learning a lot from it. I think that the, if there's one upside to it, it's that um, it's it's been a great stress test for every system that we've built and a, a lot of things can, I think, like in a, in a way that was very informative for us. Um, and uh, yeah, I think like, so monitoring models is one of the hardest things that you can do because um, it's hard to even know what what good means for most models, um, mm -hmm. and when they when they drift in their performance, it can be very difficult to detect. So, really, I think f f there's a wide variety of approaches uh, to, to doing it. Some of them involve like more like white box methods, where you're trying to kind of like inspect specific examples. So, having like a corpus of situations where the model should behave in a specific way that you that is known good to a um, to a human is a, is a really useful thing dabbling around and so so these sort of like like a white list of here are situations and predictions that we would expect the model to have um, those things are those things are good um, we do a lot of calibration so does the model 
so for instance, for pricing, we would like the average price level for the new price model to match the average price level for the old model. So there are some sanity checks like that. Um, but yeah, I think in general, it's just sort of like we catch problems and then we try to automate uh, an approach to making sure that that problem never happens again. <laughs> And, it, and that's that's a very simple sort of a, a methodology that you, it's probably the exact same thing you'd poured over from like a Toyota factory is that as soon as you see a defect in your process, right. uh, you stop the line and you figure out how to make sure that you don't have that prop, that defect anymore. Um, but but in, in general, it's um, it's very challenging also because we're shipping new versions of the models quite often. And so the comparison between two, an old known working model and a new uh, model that we'd like propose as a candidate is a super slow evaluation process that we'd like to speed up. So I think that we're still early days as a, as a whole industry in model quality and um, it's gonna get better over time, but there's it's still a lot of unsolved problems. Yeah, no, that, that's, you know, and I've been around this business for a long time and, you know, I was a coder once upon a time and sort of the whole paradigm of coding from, you know, getting it right the first time. And once you launch it, you, it pretty much stays static. And I mean, yes, there's enhancements every year or, you know, you fix bugs, but sort of this is a completely different world of constant release, constant learning, improving. Uh, and, you know, you're in a very competitive market. So sort of these data-driven decisions are the difference between profit and loss. But with that, let me turn it over to sort of, because some really interesting uh, questions here. Um, this uh, Let's start with, how do you sort of, uh, uh, this is Phil Roth who talked about, sort of, you know, I think you mentioned manual overrides in the forecasting software, uh, which is sort of related to what I just touched on. So let me try and read it. Have you built systems so they can be inputted in standard format? Are data scientists touching the data for each override or can you accept overrides from trusted sources and have the forecasts automatically updated? Yeah, that's a, I, I like the question a lot because it's come up pretty recently is how, how do we do this handoff between, you know, humans injecting domain knowledge into the models. Uh, we have a hybrid system where we sort of, the model makes a baseline forecast. We notify stakeholders and then they have an opportunity to update um, the spreadsheet. Um, so we, with like, with, with some manual overrides and then, and then the model can fold them in. So it's, it's sort of like a, like a one back and forth between stakeholders um, and to, to the, to be totally honest, I think at this point we have to trust that like the, the, the people who are doing this are doing it in good faith and we do some sanity checking on their inputs, but um, but it is sort of like challenging to monitor the quality of the of the inputs that we're getting. We, we did do a big back test recently where we tried forecasting accuracy of the model with and without the manual overrides and the manual overrides do add value. So we sort of like know that they're valuable and we, we, we like to we like to facilitate including them in the model. And it does require this round trip because you have to sort of like publish a un, unmodified forecast and then sort of like wait for people to override it. This is for the business forecasting, for the real-time forecasting that powers the marketplace. We can't allow any manual interventions because it would be too slow to have that feedback loop. Hey, Sean, while I read the next question, perhaps you could stop sharing so they can get a bigger oh, yeah. emergency right now. We're both sort of, okay, perfect. Um, and, and all right. Um, how do you balance risk management? This is Lisette Highsmith uh, without compromising innovation. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, I mean, it's always, I think it's, it is a balance. Uh, we spend a ton of resources on, on testing things because if we don't innovate, then we're not gonna get better at our business. So we think of like the, and when we run tests, we know we're paying a cost of potentially making the marketplace worse. And we, and we, do, we do run tests that are failures all the time that make the marketplace worse. Um, so the innovation does cost us something. And it's actually pretty hard to account for. I think we, we often don't really know like what are we really paying from you know trying all the things that we're that we're, that we're trying in production? Um, but I you know I th I think that there's just a culture of that this that this is always worth the cost because if you if you are able to generate a benefit from a new a new a new innovation that you create that you get you get the dividends from that from there there forward in the future. So that one week of testing where maybe you had sort of like some suboptimal experience for some of your customers, you're getting the benefit for like many years in in the future. So that's the, that's the way I think about it is like the, 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 the multiplier on a good change can be so high because you're, you're planning for growth in the future where you have a lot more customers and a lot more volume. So, so the next, you know, how do you, so, you know, one of the challenges that a lot of incumbent companies, like this is a question from Mark Newman, um, you know, traditional companies is a lot more convincing that I think needs to go on about the value of data science, about making these investments in both compute and human talent. Um, 
how do you sort of, what's the conversation like at, at a sort of fundamentally data science company like Lyft about the role of leadership and sort of their willingness for lack of a better word to, in, to make the investments that it takes? Is it pretty natural or is it still work? Yeah, I, you know, to, to be honest with you, I, I don't know how our leadership team thinks about, is this the right number of data scientists? Should we have 10 times as many? Should we have half as many? Um, and because it's it's an expensive thing to add to a business. And, and, I, and I think at this point, the measurement of the impacts of having this many people on staff doing things is pretty rudimentary. And we don't really know the value that, that's being generated in specific terms. And I think if you did the if you did the whole cost curve exercise where the x-axis were spent on data science salaries and the y-axis were like you know, incremental benefit generated to the business, we wouldn't really know what that curve looked like. <laughs> So we so we take a lot of this on faith, but there's a track record of you know multiple uh, multiple like wins from having like enacted new policies that were based on machine learning models that are you know on the order of like 25, 30, 50 percent more efficient than doing it in some heuristic way that we were doing before. So so if you, if you believe that you can generate you know some something that sort of like increases the productivity of your business by more than 10 percent. It might be worth like almost any investment that you can you can make to do that. So so I do think some of it's faith based, but but there is and 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 the wins are are rare relative to like you know engineering is very deterministic. When you build a new feature, it goes out and people get value from it very quickly. Uh, when you make a system better, it takes time to accrue the benefits from that. Uh, and so I think we're sort of like operating on faith a little bit, but but we do have evidence that that there are, you know, anecdotal evidence that it works. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, you, one of the things, I used to do benchmarking studies a long time ago. Uh, one of the things you always say is, you, know, you benchmark against yourself over time. Like how more, how much more efficient are you over processes and, you know, what measures are important to your company? Uh, yeah, one I think, Go ahead, sorry. I just wanted to mention, I, I think it's, partly it's a philosophy of like, what kind of company do you want to be? Um, if you want to go cheap on sophistication, I think you could do that. There's a version of Lyft that we could run where we say no innovation, we just fire everybody and just run the algorithms as as is. Uh, I, I I think that's not the choice that we made. We we made the cho the choice to like continue to get better, and and to do that, you just have to pour resources in. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, how do you and how do you divide the work between data scientists? This is a question from Eric Moreno. Uh, different tasks. One focuses on modeling. Another on okay, I think moved on me. Another on A/B testing. Another on data engineering. There's clearly lots. There's a portfolio of competencies that you need. Uh, and I know you had the data science team, but who surrounds you in the other parts of Lyft? Yeah, there's, I mean, it's a wide variety of roles that are all, you know, mutually supporting each other. Uh, I, I will call out to the, the data engineers do some of the least glamorous work and, uh, and we really appreciate it because there's really not much we could do if we didn't have stable systems to, to do the, you know, all the back end computation and the pipelines that need to be run to support all this stuff. So data engineers, super important. Um, every, every piece of infrastructure that we spin up requires, you know, some ownership from some engineering team and some ops team. So like, there's just like an incredible amount of supporting work that needs to get done. Um, and data, a lot of data scientists might not even really know that there's like a, you know, a team of dozens or even hundreds of people required just for them to be able to run a query and train a model. But that's, that's the fact of the matter is that the, like there's a high fixed cost to running a data science operation. Um, there are roles specific within data specifically within data science. So there's some further heterogeneity, like even within the science role. And so at Lyft, we have two kinds of data scientists divided into two, three tracks. So we have a um, algorithm data science focus data scientists focus on decisions that are made by machines, and decisions data scientists focus on decisions that are made by humans. And that's a kind of a little bit of an arbitrary distinction, but it's useful for us to help sort of segment the work a little bit. And A/B testing falls into the human decision making, whereas running a new version of the pricing algorithm would fall into the algorithms uh, uh, version. And then we also have like uh, operations research and optimization experts, uh, statistics and machine learning um, are, are different tracks that we kind of like have crafted to help make sure that those people are working on the right projects and get, you know, get matched to the, to the projects that are the best fit for their skill sets. So a question from Michael LaFontaine, which actually follows what you just talked about. What's the strategy for attracting and retaining talent because um, it's it's really hard, obviously. Should you be near? And there's a sub question: Should you be near technology hubs, or do you try to draw them to the company based on perks? 
Well, I mean, Lyft's based in San Francisco, so we do the same thing a lot of other tech companies do, which is you know, try to exploit those agglomeration economies as much as possible. Um, and and it, it is a very like um, hot job market for data scientists and they do switch jobs a lot. And, um, and, I, and I think that's been, it's been a real challenge for the industry because there's always a cooler company to work for. <laughs> so we try to attract people based on the quality of the people. So we have, you know, a lot of talented people to work with and, and people to learn from and the quality of the problems. So we, there's interesting things and we have like, you know, not everything at Lyft is a solved problem and there's lots of opportunity to have impact. Um, and, and then, you know, like all the other stuff that you would choose to work at a company for the, the culture, um, the, you know, the, the believing in the product and the mission, um, all those things are, are important, but it is, I mean, I, I, I won't lie. I think that like our, we have a really hard time um, with, with talent in general, because there's so many great jobs for data scientists out there. Um, one strategy that we do try is to is to have like a more public facing view of what we're doing internally. So we have a blog where we try to write a lot of a lot of what I'm talking about. You can go and read blog posts about in much more detail than what I'm talking about. And we're very open about the work that we do because it, it signals that it's the kind of place where, you know, as a data scientist, you could um, you can talk about your work and you and that what you're learning on your at the job, you can actually go and take with you to your next job. Um, and so that you get to kind of appropriate some of the gains from the learning that you're doing. Um, and, and that's important to data scientists. It's a, it's a job that depreciates rapidly. Your, your skill depreciates rapidly. So the ability to continue learning and to take that learning with you further down the line in your career is I think something that is, a, is an important philosophy. Now, a very specific question from uh, site, but do uh, you guys work on rider churn? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, you know, rider, ch rider churn is an important uh, I question. How, how can data science help? How can it, data yeah, that's a, I mean, ultimately every problem that you have as a business, you have to have a lever of some kind, something that you can do to have some causal effect on it. And, and so for writer, writer turns actually one that's quite challenging. So if people leave the platform, we might not have any, any ability to ever, you know, um, re-engage with them again. They might, they might not have the app anymore. They might have turned off email. So we have no tools to, to get writers back when they've, when they've fully churned. And so a lot of these things boil down to sort of like generic policies around how do we make writers happier? And, and it turns out the easiest way to make writers happier is to just give them good service levels and low prices. <laughs> And so a, a lot of writer churn problems actually translate quite directly into write, you know, writer experience problems. And can we, can we make the product better for them? And, that, and ultimately a lot of our tools for making the writer experience better boil down to market balance, which is what I talked about in the, in the slides. So, so you know, thinking about what is our policy space is like things that we can spend money on, new features in the app, um, you know, e emails and communications with people, incentives of various kinds. Um, it, it's, it's actually not a wide variety of things that we can do. It, it, a lot of the, the bottleneck in, in solving problems is just sort of like we as a company only have a handful of tools at our disposal to make the product experience better so that people won't churn. And yeah, that's sort of an interesting comment because it ultimately does boil down to the levers you have. Um, there's now quite, so there's a question about uh, when you have drivers who drive for just Lyft or Lyft and one of its competitors, um, how does, does that add a random, the, the, the question from Bill is, uh, it seems like this would add a random complexity. How would you account for the situation in matching drivers with riders? Yeah, I mean, so uh, dr drivers are considered to be um, idle for Lyft and that's the state that we, we can kind of like create a match for them, um, but they, you know, they may be idle for Lyft and, and for Uber at the same time, and uh, and so they might choose to take a ride that that would, they were matched to on the other platform. And so this this is sort of just like a source of errors that we can make. Um, it's very difficult for us to know, you know, what the, whether they're engaging in this. And so it's 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 sort of like uh, something that I think we probably could have more sophisticated solutions to than 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 we probably do. But the, the matching cycle stuff is quite resilient. So like you know if if we if we're not able to match you to a driver this cycle or the driver cancels, uh, you know you get a driver as soon as we can. Um, and so like mainly we we rely on the system to be resilient to these things just through sort of like iteratively rematching rather than sort of like any sophisticated understanding of like what the driver's uh, int intentions or sort of like latent state is. But I, I agree that like the fact that we operate in a market where 
both the writer, the writers can check both apps and the drivers can check both apps makes the whole business like a lot more complicated. There's a several questions, so I can't really name the, the, the Michael LaFontaine and some other questions too. Like uh, in terms of sort of the sensor data, both within a car or from the highway, is there anything that you're doing that's collecting sort of external data that you can use uh, from, like I said, from the cars, from the road, from whatever sensor is out there? That's a good question. Um... I might have to punt on that one. I think I think like uh, the, we have the GPS data from the car. There's you know from the phone, and there's some accelerometer data in there, so we know about acceleration and you know it's dire direction that people are headed. And we we use this to make sure that we do a thing called real time map matching, which is figuring out like what road segment the that a driver's on, um, and that algorithm uses like every, every sensor in the phone is being. Uh, applied to make sure that that problem is well solved because not, not knowing where the driver is is a huge problem for us. Um, but I don't know about external data. I think we do we we, we do kind of uh, mapping map quality data is an incredibly important input to our process. And OpenStreetMaps is what we use for our maps, and we contribute a lot of uh, of edits back to OpenStreetMaps. And so making sure that our map is up to date and reflects sort of like the current state of every road segment is actually one of the one of the more important problems. Because our ETA algorithm relies on that to know, like, oh, the driver could get there because that that road segment exists. So that that is a very important source of external data that we do use quite extensively. And then there's a specific question from Kanan uh, with regard to the ML tools you use, commercially available tools, or are these all homegrown, open source? Uh, I mean, I think like any company, there's a there's a variety of of so pieces of software. I, I would say the the Lyft, like GitHub probably has on the order of, of thousands of, of software packages in it that are used for sm small bits of functionality. And you know, some of them are open source, some of them, some of them are not. Um, and ultimately like it's it, the, the real interesting bit is how we compose all those tools together. And that's the real value that we generate. So we're, Lyft, is, Lyft open source is a lot of what we, what we work on um, because it's not really like the, the software isn't the business, um, but we also sort of like, we pay a cost every time we open source something because we have to go and then support it with the whole community. So there's there's lots of trade-offs in like build, build or buy or build, build yourself and then open source um, that we're kind of constantly navigating. But yeah, I, don't, I, I think that in general, like you can't build a platform like Lyft without a ton of open source stuff, but you also can't open source everything that you build. And, and, and then, um, sort of the choice between upskilling employees for sort of AI ML capabilities versus sort of hiring talent with experience skills. So they suspect you do both, but if you could talk a little bit about the hiring. Yeah, I, that's, that's the, the clear answer to that one is you have to do both. <laughs> and then part of they, they mutually reinforce each other when you bring in smart people, they can help upskill the people that are on the team. Um, sorry, sorry, I forget the second part of the question. The, so the question was, uh, maybe I made it into two parts. It's actually probably yeah. just one part. But the idea was, you know, you, you know, do you hire experienced people only, or do you also upskill? Uh, oh, speak, speaking about the hiring side of things, um, yeah. att attracting really, really top talent is is the is the hardest part. I think, like, I think there's a. The, there's a set of data scientists that I think are are the kind that teach teach other people and mentor them and help bring your company into the future and certain technologies that you don't know a lot about. So, a good example would be um, uh, there's not a lot of people at Lyft who have uh, uh, deep learning expertise, and it's 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 relatively rare because the the company hired a lot of the data scientists before that became very hot, and now we would love to you know, invest more deeply in deep learning, but there's those people have great jobs at other companies by now. So we're, we are trying to make up a deficit there and, it, and it's an important investment for us to kind of bring, bring our, modernize our approaches as much as possible. Um, and so, yeah, we do, we do strategically try to hire people who have, I always call it, and this is, this is a little jargony, but expanding the convex hull of your skill set at your company. There's, there's certain gaps and skills that, you know, if you get somebody who can apply that skill, they can teach other people. And it really does, it, it creates a whole new space of solutions to problems that you don't, you don't currently have. Um, and so we, we do try to identify that and yeah, deep, deep learning, reinforcement learning are all kind of areas that we're kind of aggressively trying to staff up on right now because they're, they're, that we think of them as like potentially, um, you know, step function improvements and how we're working. Yeah, one of the things I'd like to actually advance to sort of the audience today is because I, I think these, you know, like deep learning is showing its uh, value in protein folding and, you know, 
far outperforming university biochem departments and so on. And today I read a really great story about how, uh, you know, there's a new company that's been launched that is targeting property and casualty insurance because apparently like big disasters like wildfires are not easily covered. And so business and eruption risks, which we're all experiencing as we speak. Um, and so they're trying to develop a big data, data science approach to business interruption insurance. And so I think the point of what you're saying is as you get more and more sophisticated techniques into or technology and technologists into your human, into your talent pool, I think you can solve sort of more uh, complex uh, problems. One is sort of a, a sort of a interesting question, and I've heard it before. Uh, like, where should a data science organization sit within a company? This is Glenda, so it should it be within the IT organization? And some people believe it should be in the business somewhere straddling to clearly this is sort of an intermediate role. I mean, not an intermediary role uh, uh, in most companies. Yeah, I, you know, it's a hard question. I, I think that there are trade-offs no matter how you, how you do it. Um, I think having the good leadership is really the key. Like wh whoever it rolls up to, you know, you have to have some somebody it terminates in who really believes in the value proposition of the data science and is, is willing to fund the work through making sure that it's well staffed and that, you know, it has all the resources that it needs. Um, and, and so like, I think that the, the person at the very top believing in it and, and investing in it is really what I care about the most as a, as a working data scientist. Um, the collaborations with the cross-functional teams, I think kind of end up working out on, on their own, regardless of, the organizational structure, because there's just so much at the, at least I've worked at two, two big tech companies, so maybe not the largest sample possible, but um, you always have to work cross-functionally. There's never one project that can be done by just one, you know, one pillar of the organization. Even engineers can't do things unilaterally. They, they need product people to help inform the roadmap and how it fits in with the rest of the strategy. They need designers to help figure out what it's gonna look like for users. Um, they need UX researchers to understand and be the voice of the customer. So there's just like almost every project at both Facebook and, and Lyft that I've worked on is, is a collaborative project across multiple pillars. And what, what team or pillar that they roll up to is often sort of inconsequential for the project that, that's being done. So, so for me, I think like where it sits in the organization is wherever it will get the, bet, the most resourcing and the biggest belief in its potential. Yeah, and, and you know, and that's a, that's a really hard organizational challenge because you know younger companies like Lyft, uh, you know, are built around sort of being, you know, software powered from day one. And I think it's a little bit harder for existing companies, or a lot harder with, you know, built-in incentive system. There's several questions here about uh, sort of what happens once sort of um, you've decided that your model is working well, and sort of how do you partner with software teams? How does some how does a model go into production really? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a long-term process. I, I was just reflecting on something that we start, a project we started about a year ago. It was just finally being, was tested like the first time in like November and now we're running like another test in uh, just, just now at the end of January. So it's like, you know, it's six to eight months uh, of, of time between idea to like offline model results to getting it integrated in with the, you know, and with the production algorithms. And there's a there's just sort of like a set of phases of model validation, and probably the most interesting one is sort of there's a hybrid between offline and online, where what we call shadow, where we run the we run the algorithm normally, and we don't change the user experience at all, but we log what would have happened if we had run it according to the machine learning algorithm. So for the you know the matching algorithm that I described uh, for dispatch, we can we can log like hey if we had used this machine learning algorithm to to do matching, here's what we would have allocated. Um, here's the driver that this person would have gotten, um, and it's complicated to analyze that data that comes out of that. But but we do we do try to do a good job of saying well, assessing the shadow data to understand what the risk is, and then if the shadow data looks good. We can actually always, almost all of our algorithms have the ability to do like a hybrid policy where we can do a, like a average the production algorithm and a new one, or we can flip a coin and do one or the other. So there's an ability to sort of like interpolate between the old policy and the new policy to make it safer. So there's lots of options for sort of gradually rolling things out and trying things. We, for, for us, we can try things in a small number of regions or in a smaller region that's less risky. So there's, there's ways for us to sort of like you know, get a model into production and then 
actually try it in a real market context that don't don't involve launching it to everybody and incurring a, a, ton, a ton of risk. Um, but that that playbook, even even the point up until where you get it into shadow, is actually quite a long journey because um, there's just the integration stuff. Fig going from a prediction to a decision is actually quite a complicated thing. There's lots of heuristics and filters that need to be built in. It's never just like the machine learning model spits out what to do. It, it's just an input into like a larger system. Now, as I hear you talk, because you know you guys are innovating so rapidly and adding features to your platform, there has to be sort of the architecture is just crucial because you're actually plugging in new modules on a fairly uh, regular basis, right? On all aspects of the business. Yeah, there's a there's a real art to getting that right. Where um, if you get it right, you can be really agile, and if you get it wrong, then everything is a really high engineering cost of integration. Um, the, the key the key idea there is that um, any change to your models or you know parameters of your of your system should be configuration, not code. And if you can make it so that it's configuration, then it unlocks a whole lot of ability to be to, to test things really quickly. If, if changing things requires shipping code, then it slows things down a lot. It makes everything a lot riskier. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a big principle at Facebook and also at Lyft to just sort of favor configuration um, over code as much as possible because it, it sort of like makes every version of Lyft is just like a file that you can change <laughs> and all the backend stuff that supports that should be interchangeable and relatively standardized. Yeah, and that's much harder, obviously, for legacy organizations. I'm going to sort of close the last question for you. Uh, what's some advice for, so, you know, a lot of companies uh, in our audience are not as sophisticated as the lifts of this world. Uh, so if you're trying to get started in data science, and not in data science, but build a data science organization, like what are some common mistakes, some sort of uh, advice that you can give people getting started? Yeah, I, I think that um, I have to sort of extrapolate here because I, I haven't like, been the first data scientist at a, at a company before. But if I had to do it, um, I would start with your single hardest problem that you think data could be useful for um, and, and try to envision like what like a small change to that would be that's feasible to, you know, within some amount of time. I, I think big ambitious data projects are, are always uh, at high risk of failure. Um, and data scientists that don't have specific applications or scope to improve the business in some way are going to flail around and not be able to make progress. So it, when you have a clear mapping between the data scientists and some and some thing that they have to change and improve, um, and that thing is important for your business, um, and you give them the resources to make sure that that happens, such as the engineering support that they need, um, then you can unlock a lot of value. But the, you really need the confluence of all of those things, because I think just hiring data scientists isn't enough. Just having data isn't enough. Um, it's 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 really sort of like all those balls have to line up. Great, thank you so much, Sean, for a fantastic presentation. I might uh, just uh, I'll just take one more minute to wrap. Uh, so thank you all to the audience for your love, wonderful questions. I don't think we've gotten more questions for any of our events than for you, Sean. And I <laughs> sort of feel bad for the people that I couldn't get to. I was desperately trying to read as many and combine them into sort of complex questions, but there's still 24 questions that I have not been able to get to. So thank you for bearing with us. We will um, hopefully try and bring you more events where we can try to get some of these questions answered. I just want to close with a couple of things. So first of all, Sean, thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. My pleasure. I want to remind everybody that we have a, another wonderful event on February 23rd. It's Nicole Perlrott from the New York Times. She's one of the lead cybersecurity reporters. And she's got a book coming out in the next couple of weeks as well. This is how they tell me the world ends. And as you've all been seeing with the solar winds thing and the attacks on sort of US government institutions, cybersecurity is just get, you know, is 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 getting to be a bigger challenge for more and more organizations. Uh, so if you can join us for that one, it's on February 23rd, 530 to 630 PM. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, KPMG, for making these events possible. And once again, Sean, thank you again for joining us. We know how busy you are. So Really appreciate it. Uh, they, were, they were great questions. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you all for attending. We just loved you joining us at all our events. And uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, we couldn't do this without you.